Okay, so uh, thanks to the editors of European CSLA Photo 4, but we'll do it anyway. Thanks to the editors of the European Urban and Regional Studies for inviting me to be one of the two open competitors this evening. And thanks to Louisa for kicking off the conference with such a great talk. Finally, many thanks also to Cathy Wood, the journal's editorial manager, for her role in organising my attendance, and also to George, one of the local uh, MA students, who did a great job at welcoming me last night. I'm particularly delighted to have been invited to speak at this conference, as I've published in hers a couple of times. The last is part of a special issue around notions of expertise and knowledge in urban governance, using a specific example of business improvement districts. In their, and their role in particular forms of neoliberal governance regimes. This paper and much of my work for the last five years is what I want to draw upon tonight. So what I'd like to do over the course of the next 30 minutes or so is just to make some general and rather speculative remarks based upon one aspect of a wider ongoing programme of research. And Louise was talking about hers being at the beginning and I guess I'm probably towards the end of this bit of the research project. So the programme has used a range of qualitative methods to explore some of the ways in which some of the cities in Europe and beyond are looking to experiment with the financing of certain redevelopment projects as a means of growing their economy and projecting themselves into the world in very specific ways. And my starting point in Edinburgh and Scotland was of a city experimenting as a result of a double whammy, or on the one hand the global financial crisis, but also the austerity that has been introduced by the UK government. In my examples, I'm interested in the notion of debt-based financing and value capture mechanisms, and how the experiences of certain cities have been drawn upon and reflected as this mode of policy has emerged in a range of locations around the world. Um, and at the end, we talked about Venice as a model, I'm going to talk a little bit about other types of models. There are also lots of other examples, I think, across a range of policy areas, many of which we'll hear about in the next couple of days, where this, what Jane Jacobs talks about as strategic instances, are observable. So in recent years, I've seen a number of books on the importance of cities, uh, and the importance of cities in particular for the wider world's future. They gain traction in political, policy and popular debates. There are too many to mention them all here, and I guess the ones I choose to name say more about me than the books, their importance. But here I guess I'm thinking of Richard Florida's Cities of the Creative Class, Edward Glazer's Triumph of the City, Benjamin Barber's If Mayors Rule the World, Anthony Townsend's Smart Cities, and Charles Montgomery's Happy City, just to name five. Couched as responses to the ideological political failings of the nation state, too bureaucratic, too corrupt, too un undemocratic, too unwieldy, the focus on cities offers them up as a new urban frontier echoing but different the way that Neil Smith used the term in the mid-1990s. Here is an opportunity, we are told, by a political renewal and starting afresh. Keep those institutions and networks that have emerged connecting cities while augmenting, enhancing and formalising their capacities. In the case of the US, Goldberg writing the nation argues that these books and others reflect a growing orthodoxy amongst those both on the left and the right the city is now the primary site for policy experiments and laboratories for innovations, whether it be in the introduction of living wages or in the downsizing slash right-sizing of government. Accompany these books and create the conditions for how they've been received by civil society, the media, NGOs, policymakers, politicians, think tanks, and so on, is the informational infrastructure that has been assembled, blogs, co-eds, interviews, presentations, prep releases, and podcasts. A bit like the one that I'm participating in now that we go live on the website. While there is much that divides these books, what together they constitute, along with others of course, as a renewed focus on the agency and capacity of something called the city to act to be a site for progressive environmental, economic, political and social transformation. And for a moment we have to part, at least for the purpose of this talk, any notion that cities act as one in any real sense. So in terms of specifics, for example, in the work of Benjamin Barber, his particular contribution is to lay out a separate recommendations about the role cities might play in the future governments of the world. What he argues is about governing cities globally. The Global Parliament of Mayors is the proposal which has received most widespread attention. As Barber puts it, as a starting point for giving institutional expression to the needs to realise some form of constructive democratic independence, 
I propose then that the government convening of a global parliament of mayors, call it a world assembly of cities. To begin such an assembly would represent a modest first step towards formalising the myriad of networks of cities already actively cooperating across borders around issues as mundane as express bus lanes, bike share programmes and web-based information collection, and as momentous as climate change, nuclear security and intelligence gathering. Let's leave aside the virtues of the global parliament of the world assembly. What I want to do is pick up another aspect of Barber's argument. On one hand, this is a statement about the current set of relations between cities and the mayors. As he puts it, the intercity civic infrastructure already in place comprises, comprises in its present form an informal approximation of the kinds of collaboration and confederal partnership that prospective mayors of Ireland represent. Specifically, he ident identifies a number of features to the current global urban system that point to the generative capacity of city to city collaboration, comparison, exchange, and learning. Many of these are formal relationships, these are the myriad of networks in which Barber writes. On the other hand, though, he also points to more informal means through which ways of doing things emerge out of particular urban locations and then find themselves travelling, potentially being introduced elsewhere. So to quote him again, there's already been a great deal of what you might call best practice sharing, as with bike sharing program that started in Latin America in the early 70s. That's viral best practice that has spread around the world. Beyond that, there's room for ratcheting that up, because the dysfunctions of nation state means that the kind of cooperative, bilateral, multilateral agreements that we have looked for simply can't happen. And it's on the subject, <coughs> the informal global urban policy making, I want to focus on my talk. I want to highlight how we might understand the contemporary extras, extrospective nature of urban policy, making that, making that locate cities in the world, and of course, as we've heard, it's not you, the world in the city. Or put another way, in the current institutional political climate, climate, in the context of these dysfunctional nations, how are we to understand those intercity networks that are held to be the governance building blocks for a new geopolitical order? What work takes place to bring alive these formal structures and what work gets done between and beyond them through more ad hoc, incremental and informal ways in which cities perform governing globally? Um, I put that up there just to give you something to look at. Uh, it's bus rapid transit. This is a model that has travelled around the world, has uh, reappeared and reappeared in a number of uh, cities and countries. Uh, always slightly variation of the theme, and which people have written a lot about as an idea that has uh, both progressive and regressive tendencies and that matters in different kinds of ways in different cities and have paid attention to the network through which this idea is travelled. It's not one I've worked on, but it's right an interesting topic. So the urban policy world is in almost constant motion, it often seems. In a figurative sense, policymakers, understood as a broad category of actors of different geographical reach, seem to be under increasing pressure to make things happen, to keep up with what is in and out within their own particular field. Of course, the actual making of policy and of influencing and shaping the lives of citizens is often far less exciting and much more mundane than one would think on the basis of its representation on blogs and in professional publications. If you've ever interviewed people who make policy, you get a real sense of our everyday, mundane, ordinary ways that go into making what are sometimes positioned as but rather kind of cosmopolitan and exotic ways of doing policy. Anyway, nevertheless, as experimentation and innovation has arrived and dispersed across the urban policy making landscape, so has the company churning been identified in urban policy with new ideas and initiatives to replace the old ones with increasing regularity. So contemporary urban policy making at all scales, therefore, involves the regular scanning of policy making landscapes by blogs, professional publications, the media, webinars, websites, and word of mouth for ready made, off the shelf policies and best practices that can be quickly applied locally, put into action elsewhere and somewhere. Less instrumentally, but sometimes as importantly, are those ephemeral and fleeting encounters or engagements between policy makers and their work which can lead to the arriving at policies which are sometimes much harder to track uh, and acknowledge. In this context, figurative mobility in the policy world becomes literal motion. Policy actors, and here we include academics like us, activists, consultants, politicians, 
professionals, practitioners, etc., etc., act as transfer agents, in the words of Diana Stone, shuttling policies and knowledge about between cities. This occurs through attendance of conferences, consultancy work, fact finding, study trips, or policy tourism, and so on. These travels set the conditions for the potential making up of, of and arriving at urban policy. These transfers, translations, and travels involve policymakers of various geographical reach in networks that extend globally, bringing certain cities into conversation with each other, while of course pushing others further apart. So while the range of cities and the range of experiences being compared and referenced may have grown in recent years, nevertheless in many cases there still exists a hierarchy which casts some cities as more worthy of inter-urban referencing and be referenced some less. Mental maps of best cities for policy inform future urban strategies. Amsterdam for cycling, Austin for quality of life, Barcelona and Manchester, dare I say, for urban planning and regeneration, Bogota for uh, bus rapid transit, transit, Detroit for urban farm and gar gardening, Freiburg for sustainability, Portland for growth management, Porto Alegre for participatory budgeting and direct democracy, and so on. In all our areas of work, we can probably think of examples of cities that people we interview things we read about, often there are cities that are referenced. Thus in a policy sense, as in many other ways, cities are constituted through their relationship with other places and scales. Yet while mobility and relationality define some aspects of contemporary urban policy making, and of course there are lots of examples of big precedences for this, this is of course only half the picture. Urban policies and policy making are also intensely and fundamentally embedded, grounded, placed, Proxima and territorial. The examples just outlined confirm this point. Our ability to refer to complex approaches to vexing problems of urban policy through the use of a shorthand of city names indicates how tied certain policies are to certain specific places. For example, there is a Barcelona model of regeneration, which is contingent, of course, on the historical geographical circumstances of that city and its relationship with other regional and national forms of decision making. <laughs> that gets lost when you think about trying to think about Barcelona in the case of Manchester. While other cities might be encouraged to compare, imitate, or learn, it is generally understood that in doing so, adjustments, modifications, and translations will need to be made. Similarly, it is understood that the process of participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre, for example, will not necessarily guarantee a successful adoption elsewhere. So, this work is central to whether a city feels like a model from elsewhere is appropriate for introduction. Uh, and I just wanted to show this one image here. This is Raoul Manuel, uh, Mayor of uh, uh, Chicago. I'm talking about something I know probably too much about tax increment financing, so I'll introduce you to a bit later, uh, which is basically a way of uh, channel income streams. And in Chicago, a number of communities uh, and housing groups have been lobbying for the uh, making it more transparent of this financial mechanism so that communities know which money is being switched away from education in particular and is being kept back to offer developers sweetness for inward investing into the downtown of the loop in Chicago. So it says, thanks for five million TIF money. This is about well, giving it to one of the CEOs who works for this one of these organizations. So essentially it's being offered sweetness to relocate the downtown. These, there are a number of these that have been going on over the last couple of years in Chicago, which kind of reinforce the territorial nature of the relational politics of urban policy making. Furthermore, policy is fundamentally territorial in that it's tied up with wholly a set of locally dependent interests, with those involved in growth coalitions, for example, being the most example. Although activists, NGOs, and social movements are often involved in urban placemaking, for example, I showed the one on the TIF in Chicago but also through seeking to push back against gentrification, land privatisation and so on. And this image, it looks a lot sunnier there on that one than there, uh, was taken um, in Sacramento in California. Uh, there was not anything particularly unique about this project, which was about um, finding a use for a, a large chunk of brownfield land that was no longer being used, it was part of a rail intersection, um, and they were trying to find ways to use it, and they were trying to think about imaginative ways in which you could predict future income streams to change this land use. Um, and the community groups were pushing back against that and saying, well, actually, who is this land for? Uh, can we have a more affordable housing? Those sorts of issues. 
So as, as such, urban policy making, I think, is to be understood both relationally and territorially, as both in motion and simultaneously fixed, or embedded in place. The contradictory nature of policy should not, however, be seen as detriment, detrimental to its operation. Rather, the tension between urban policy is both dynamic and relational on the one hand, and fixed in territorial on the other, is generative. It generates interesting ideas, possibilities. It is necessary to produce policy in places, as a number of human geographies have argued, uh, geographies have argued over numerous decades. So how might we think about bringing together the big and the small acts of assembly from a relational to a territorial perspective? With this in mind, an appropriate point of departure is to consider the already existing literatures that exist <laughs> on the ways in which policies move. This explores how policies, including urban policies, are learned from one context and move to another with a hope of similar results. In one sense, this is a literature that is all about global relations and territories. It has a relatively long history, dating back to the 60s, but it's really in the early 1990s that the field expanded, as I quote, the scope and intensity of policy transfer activity increased significantly. This now voluminous, voluminous literature, largely in political science, while internally differentiated and heterogeneous in many regards, as one might expect, also shares some common characteristics. It focuses on modelling how transfer works, creating topologies of transfer agents, and identify conditions under which transfer leads to successful or unsuccessful policy outcomes in a new location. And it's just worth pausing to say that actually success is often calculated in quite a narrow criteria. So it's definitely not without its insights, and this continues to be the situation. Yet while this literature is certainly about global relations with territories, it is not consistent of an engagement with the full range of social and territoriality. It is limited in its definition of the agents involved in transfer, focusing largely on national and international elites, usually working in formal institutions. It fo focuses almost exclusively on national territories, i.e. the transfer from A to B among nations or amongst localities within single nations. It negates to consider intercity transfers that trans transcend national boundaries, connecting cities globally. Furthermore, it tends to consider transfer as a, as a socio-spatial process in which urban policies, for example, are not open to war from Utah. These limits, which seek to understand what work gets done in and through these intercity networks, which go as to explain the movement best practice, are an example of the sort of work that Benjamin Barber talks about. And yet, on the other hand, we have an emerging, or had an emerging literature, in geography, but beyond the anthropology and sociology. For Wakont, the weak Wakont, the American sociologist, the aim should be to constitute link by link the long chain of institutions, agents, and discursive supports that constitute the current historical period. Wendy Lana, taking a slightly different but related approach, also advocates a move in the same intellectual tradition towards a more careful tracing of the intellectual policy <coughs> practitioner networks that underpin the global expansion of ideas and their subsequent manifestation in government policies and programs. Explicitly interested in understanding both how and why governing practices and expertise are moved from one place to another, she advocates the detailed tracings of social practices, relations and embeddings. Much of the mobility's work attempts to understand the detail of a particular form of mobility or a specific infrastructure that facilitates or channels mobilities, in reference to wider processes and contexts. But I'd argue this language is useful it allows the framing of the making of urban policy in the world in such a way as to emphasise the social and the scale, the feet and the mobile features of urban policies. So not being seduced by my mobility, but rather acknowledging it as a constituting element to the making up and arrival of urban policy. Mm -hmm. The notion of mobility is being marshaled in the sense that people frequently working in and across a variety of institut institutional settings draw upon and mobilise expertise, ideas and knowledge to serve particular interests. This argument here is one that necessitates we pay attention to how through ordinary and extraordinary activities, policies are made mobile to what occurs and the relationship between the movement of urban policies and the socio-spatial restructuring of cities. And here's just a few examples which I'm going to come talk to. One on the left hand side is another example of the ways in which uh, local activists were campaigning against the use of tax income and financing as a, and a way it drove gentrification in downtown Chicago. The one on the far right is uh, part of a long-standing debate that uh, 
in California about the use of redevelopment uh, and its eventual closure and what was at stake in terms of thinking about the financing of the state, California, but also its various cities, and in particular <coughs> affordable housing. And the one in the middle, uh, this reflects uh, a campaign that was launched by some architects in Edinburgh who were arguing for a slightly more progressive and inclusive vision for its waterfront. And that included how that was paid for and basically who would carry the debt into the future. And I'll come back and talk about that as well. Um, here's one that maybe we'll ask quite some keen cyclists. Um, because, in a sense, what uh, part of what underpins the ways in which these uh, policies appear and reappear in different places is these such examples of study tools, which are these events that take place where people go to elsewhere and experience something. And there's something about the authenticity about being somewhere else and touching somewhere else and seeing something else and hearing about it in place that even allowing for the kind of infrastructure we have in place now around the world, around the internet, etc., still means that being there matters. And so one has a long history to these sorts of study tours, but one can see, can see them proliferate across different areas of policy making as part of this wider understanding of the ways in which uh, global urban policy is made. So I guess the question, I think, remains how we might best frame these sorts of empirical discussion in the context of a view of the global that is increasingly, increasingly generated from the Earth. And I just want to make four points before I go and talk about a little bit about finance. So one way is, I think, is quite important to develop and hold a theorisation of urban policy making and place making as an assembly of territorial and relational geographies, recognising the material reality of each and the productive tensions between them without affording either of them preeminence. Second, work with a broad appreciation and understanding of who falls in with the category of transfer agents. This requires to take seriously the movement and translation of interurban transnational expertise, ideas, and knowledge, understanding this movement and the work that it does as socio spatial, power laden process in which urban policies are subject to change, contestation, struggle as they've rendered mobile, and also failure. Third, I think, thinking about um, the making up of a policy in its all various guises, raise a whole series of methodological, methodological implications of analysing global circuits of urban policy making. There's value in paying attention to how various spaces are brought into being during the travels of a policy, or an attempt to manage the movement of global flows in and through cities. And one reference, it's old now, but it still has some perks, I would argue, is Barrowway's global ethnographies and an attention to particular contexts and to global forces, connections, and metaphors. Following policies, policymakers, experts, and regulators through specific urban global spaces involves a set of largely qualitative and ethnographic efforts. And I think finally, the methodological and analytical approach, uh, I'd argue, has at its core an orientation the mutual constitution of structure and agency. So rather than a set of mutually constituted macro supply and demand contexts, frame the potential realised movement of policies, empowering them through some singers, idea brokers, or mediators, and disappearing, disappearing some others. Some, more, some ideas or policies are more like trouble than others. The policy making landscape thus is an uneven one, produced through past and contributing to future unevenness. That is not said that the policy law is a closed shop. Those whose power draws from a strong resource base do not always get things their own way. Oppositional or subtle alternative groups, as well as governments of ideologies that differ from the norm, are able to inhabit and utilise the same global circuits of policy groups to develop alternative assemblages of policy power, even if most examples, unfortunately, they do so against the odds. So, having just said that, talk more generally about one way of thinking about urban policy making. And what I want to do now is just spend a little bit of time talking about financing urban futures, which is the example that I've started off with um, and is the one I've been working with over the last couple of years. And this takes me back to the notion of austerity and crisis. So uh, cities around the world have begun to explore and experiment with new ways of putting in place the hard and soft infrastructure to create the green conditions for growth. So one of those examples is debt-based finance. 
which means that cities are becoming ever more wired into the global financial system. So calculations over which sorts of projects to pursue are being shaped by the assumptions and the models underpinning policies, such as tax and financing. So this is where my empirical project started, which is the waterfront in Edinburgh. It's called the Leave Waterfront, but it's actually in Edinburgh. And the challenge this city faced, but it's not as a challenge that a number of other cities in Europe and around the world have faced, as I say, to what to do with a large chunk of land, a brownfield regeneration scheme. In the context of, on the one hand, a global financial crisis which had the private sector and bits of capital ever more risk averse, and on the other hand, on the other hand particularly in the UK and Scotland, of public sector austerity, which meant that basically the public sector had little wiggle room to offer the kind of grants and schemes it might have one, might have one offer, might have once offered to encourage people to locate them. I'm not going to spend a large amount of time talking about this if people are really interested in TIFF, and actually mm. I'm TIFF, I'm going to talk about TIFF, but there are lots of other examples of similar models that do the same kind of thing, which is essentially create an income stream. So you imagine we have you all in a room here, we decide we want to get together and we want to borrow 20 million and we want to put in some infrastructure. New roads, high speed network, whatever else. It's going to cost us 20 million. So what we do is we borrow that 20 million. Okay, we create a debt of 20 million euros and then we use the extra things we've done, the new infrastructure, the new road, the wires, to create extra taxes and we use those taxes to pay down the debt. So it's basically a way of creating debt. Um, as I can talk about it a bit more. But what it involves is a vision of the future. It involves emotional work, and I'll come and show some quotes in a minute, and a belief in a certain version of the future. You have to buy into that version because you have to believe that what you're doing now is going to generate the revenue to pay down the debt you've established, essentially, from scratch. Now, it has its origins in California in the 1950s, but actually, it's the experience in Chicago in the 1990s which captured the imagination of policymakers from around the world, in the UK, but also in Australia, Canada, and now in South Africa, who have begun to think about using either TIF or something like TIF as a way of paying for upfront costs on infrastructure that they will then believe will deliver the growth, in, I say, in the context of austerity. So, my project was to speak to people both in Chicago, California, and other places around the world, and get them to talk a little bit about how it was they came to know about TIFF and how they, the travels they were involved in. So here's a quote in, um, which talks, this is someone from Edinburgh who was considering thinking about using the idea uh, in, and talks a little bit about it um, and explains basically what I've just said, a bit about the crisis on the one hand which left them with an unwilling set of uh, public, private stakeholders who weren't prepared to spend the money up front to kickstart this waterfront redevelopment, and on the other hand, they had no budgets to draw. There was no grant, there was no income. In fact, they were cutting budgets across the piece. And the last point is the last point that is interesting, because in a sense, what this does is tap into a set of emotional geographies about what you believe the future could be. So, in a sense, there's, there's a, a belief that there will be growth. So, e even though often some of these mechanisms these financial mechanisms often presented as quite technocratic formal mechanisms where there's a hard scientific evidence base behind them, and sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. Actually, often when you get down to it, when you speak to people who are involved in designing them and in producing them, it's often actually about an emotional attachment to a version of the future, which of course is made more likely by these kinds of policies. Um, this is someone else I spoke to in Edinburgh who also reiterates the point about the fact that you had uh, went to a few meetings, property developers, and basically they weren't prepared to do the kind of work that was required at the beginning, uh, and also they weren't prepared for the public sector. So you had this crisis of austerity playing out in the city, creating the preconditions for cities in the UK at the time to think about experimenting and innovating with how they sought to create debt and finance infrastructure. Uh, of course, Edinburgh wasn't the only city to visit Chicago. It wasn't the only place. Numerous people from around the world were visiting Chicago to find out about what had gone on, how it had been successful or not, etc., etc. But I interviewed a couple of people who'd been on these study tours in the 1990s. 
got to talk a bit about what they felt while they were there, what they did, how important it was to be, how important it was to be there, as a way of moving beyond some of the ways in which the movement of policy from one place to another is often represented in academic uh, work, which is often actually not represented, as if nothing happens on the way between A and B. It leaves A and the policies introduced to B. So reinforcing, I guess, the sense that this is a deeply embodied uh, set of actions. So the first person just talks a bit about Chicago and how important it was. Um, the second person who was in Edinburgh talks about their, actually their, their visit to San Francisco because they were playing around with, if you like, thinking about the future, about this waterfront, how they may pay for it. They read some of the reports that were produced from this first quote, first and first quote, and they went to San Francisco, interviewed people, spoke to activist groups, spoke to policymakers, tax uh, financiers, lawyers, and got a sense about how the model hadn't had work and what it might look like, the kind of translated work that might be required in Edinburgh. One final couple of quotes. And again, to reiterate this notion about what happens on the way, the making up as it goes along, the kind of travels that are involved, a couple of quotes there, just by people who are part of this study too, who talk a little bit about uh, what happened, uh, the excitement it generated, the kind of reflection that went on as you travelled. Um, a bit like you going back to your conference and speaking to your colleagues in your departments when they ask you what was this conference like, you're going to go back and you're going to see if you're not going to represent everything. You're going to make sense of it, you're going to reflect on the various conversations you've had. Uh, and in a sense, what this thinking about the making of the world of policy this way does is get into the black box about the kinds of policies that then go out and shape uh, various social groups in cities around Europe and the world. Of course, this is much part of a much wider conversation, not just in the UK, but further afield about infrastructure and who owns cities and the ways in which capital is increasingly being parked in cities. This came out last year. It's not a uh, professional magazine I'm often reading, Investors Chronicle, but it's just talking about building Britain and the kind of challenges that Britain and other cities face. But as I say, you've got a risk averse, increasingly risk averse private sector and public sector. One way is doing it this way, the other way is what we do in Manchester is we basically bring in Chinese capital and park it in our airport to regenerate infrastructure. This was taken in Chicago, uh, and it's interesting simply because what it says is uh, advertising um, a consultancy. Uh, it says trillions of dollars in urban redevelopment is driving the renaissance of cities worldwide. Prudential's global investment expertise can help you capitalise on this unprecedented growth. And for me, thinking about cities from this perspective challenges the location of where urban politics plays out. It challenges the location of the site of the urban, when decisions about the future financing of infrastructure or big issues are being taken place in other cities, headquarters around the world. Um, and Mike Racco has demonstrated quite clearly in the case of London that when local groups try to intervene in decisions that they care about, they're often told that various contracts are already set up that actually make it very hard for local groups to have traction or some of the big decisions that affect their lives. Okay, so in many ways it's possible to understand the popular successes of books on cities and urban futures slash global futures as capturing a particular political moment. The restlessness of the geopolitical order, if that's the right word, that emerged across the globe after the Second World War shows no sign of abating. Geographically uneven for sure, nevertheless contestation and tension over the bordering and rebordering of territories continues to characterise contemporary supranational national and urban politics. This instability, in which the almost taken for granted centrality of the nation state is no longer what it once was, without any post national settlement on the horizon, is one of the currents that is behind the projecting forward of a world in which cities become more central to the global order. Indeed, the sort of flux we've been witnessing and that lies behind some of the calls and claims about a new urban political order might indeed be the new norm. This might be the new fix. Moreover, the much referenced and rather cliched mobilising of the notion of the urban age or urban century, which renders central and perhaps even causal that the majority of the world's population call a city their home, further fuels the sense that cities are the building blocks for a new global urban order. Thinking through contemporary ways in which cities relate to one another raises some important questions about how it is that urban policy is made up and arrived at. In many instances, this involves the bringing together of the global and the urban. 
This is about the complex realities of urban governance and urban politics. No longer is it even possible or desirable to imagine the world through lenses that implicitly or explicitly locate cities within nested scalar hierarchies. The focus on relations between cities and the world, the work involved in making urban policy, acknowledges the extent to which urban politics, by its very nature, incorporates actors and interests that are often understood to be located elsewhere, although the elsewhere is somewhere, of course. This leads us, I think, with two, at least two, but two of them identify insights as we perhaps think about urban futures. First, urban politics and policy cannot and should be not taken as given, or put differently, it is difficult and perhaps unimportant to define them as scientific objects of study. There is no formula or fix them in place and explain their operation as flowing from some necessary sets of relations. Rather, they are part of an active and continuing process of production and reproduction. They are generated, assembled in particular ways, at particular times, and specific locations. The second take home message, if you like, is that urban politics cannot just be approached through place, although its placing is important, but it is also global or international in a much deeper sense, based on the extent to which it is based, because of the extent to which it is based on systems of comparing, borrowing, exchanging, imitating, learning, reinterpreting, and translating. Thank you.